Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Trupiana, and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Sometimes. Well, it's Tuesday, it's 10 a.m., so here I am. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, I hope you guys know how much I love you, I appreciate you, I love interacting with you, and I thank you so much for all your love and support that you've shown throughout all of the time I've been putting videos out. Today, we're going to tackle somebody that I've actually talked a lot about on this channel. He's very intertwined with a few other characters that I've discussed on this channel, and one of those characters happens to be the only character that I've actually read a full book on. So that gives me a little bit of a leg up on the research side of things for him. Before we start the video, I wanted to go over a few things, so this might be a little bit of a long intro. I put chapters into this episode, so if you're not interested in this part, you could just go ahead and skip to the end of the intro song. I've labeled that, so if you don't want to watch this whole intro, go ahead, click that, it'll bring you to the end of the intro, and we'll go into the video about today's gangster. So for First off, if any of you were in my live episode, I know there was a lot of people in the live that I did the other day, and I was talking about some health issues that I had, so I wanted to give a quick update on that. I do not have cancer, thank God. They were benign tumors. I have a lot. I have like nine benign tumors, but they are benign. They're non-cancerous, and I have to get ultrasounds every six months to track them, but I am all good. My grandmother died of breast cancer, so it was a very scary moment in my my life, but thank God, nothing to worry about, and I just wanted to let you guys know because I know that I did talk to you guys about it, so yeah, I'm a-okay. Secondly, I wanted to talk to you about a rabbit hole that I have been going down. If anybody is really good with, like, genealogy, could you please reach out to me? I would really appreciate it because I'm going through my ancestry for a few reasons, and it's a mess. It's so easy to get one person wrong, and then all of a sudden, your entire tree is all messed up. So I really want to know if what I'm seeing is legit or not. I originally started doing research on my ancestry because I have been putting a lot of thought into actually moving to Italy. Honestly, with everything going on in the United States right now, I don't think that there's a United States citizen alive that hasn't thought at one time or another about leaving. I'm really lucky because my great-grandmother really helped me out. I qualified for dual citizenship for Italy and America because my great-grandmother had my grandfather in America, but before she became an American citizen. Just barely. In order to qualify to be a dual citizen, your grandparent has to have been born when your great-grandparent was still an Italian citizen. My great-grandmother had my grandfather on May 23rd, 1930. She officially became a U.S. citizen on June 23rd, 1930, exactly one month after giving birth. Because my grandfather was born in America, he did not have Italian citizenship, he had American citizenship, so if she had had him in America as an American citizen, I would been screwed. I wouldn't be qualifying for dual citizenship. So I do qualify for dual citizenship. So yay, grandma. I have lawyers that are going back in my family history and they're going to petition the courts in Rome to try to get me citizenship. So I'm super excited about that. I know either way I want to live in Sicily. I've always wanted to see Sicily. I've always wanted to live there. So that's something I'm putting a lot of thought into. So anyways, my search for my Italian ancestors hit a roadblock there. There's absolutely nothing before my great-grandmother. I have all of her paperwork, all her citizenship paperwork. I have the signature from the boat that she came in on. I found out that she's from Senisi, Italy, which is awesome because I knew she was from southern Italy, which is where I want to live, but it was really cool to find out because I never knew she was from Senisi. So it's cool. I got a lot more information about where my family comes from. I probably have family in Senisi, Italy now, which would be really cool. Anyway, here's the problem that I'm having. I brought my ancestry all the way back to the 1300s. Lo and behold, when I got far back enough, I came to William Shakespeare being my grandfather. Not like my second cousin twice removed, no. My 14th grandfather. I will post it here. The only problem is, when you Google it, it says that Shakespeare has no living grandchildren. That only his stepchildren had children and his bloodline is dead. Can somebody please help me on how I can figure this out? I'm doing the DNA test. 
But like waiting for it, you have to wait like over a month and it's just, I'm not a patient person. I'm losing my mind. I want to know. Also, what happens if I can definitively prove that I am Shakespeare's grandchild? You can literally Google the people who are his grandchildren that are living right now. Do you like register somewhere or something? I really don't know. Please help. <laughs> okay, so I'm done rambling. Let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Today, we're going to be discussing the cousin of the man who was the boss of one of New York's five families for 37 years. We're going to be discussing Stefano Magadino, cousin of Joseph Bonanno. Stefano Magadino, also known as The Undertaker or Don Stefano, was born on October 10th, 1891 in Castella Mare del Golfo, Sicily, Italy. His parents were Giuseppe and Giovanni Ciaravano Magadino. Together, his parents had eight children. I'm going to read off the names of the people that I compiled to be his brothers and sisters. I can't be 100% sure. I looked into his ancestry. I I looked and found what I could, but I might have a few of these off, so don't quote me on these, but I'm pretty sure I got a decent amount of them right. What I found was Natalia DiCaprio, Caterina Magadino, Antonino Magadino, Maria Magadino, Arcangela Longo, Pietro Magadino, Gaspar Magadino, and Stefano himself. I could be off on one or two of those. There's no clear answer. Like, you can't Google his siblings' names. But I grabbed these names from a few different places that mentioned siblings, so hopefully I got most of them right. Stefano was the third of the eight children, so we have got some serious middle child energy here. Magadino was born in the absolute middle, like exactly, you know, everything is at the worst of the worst in a feud between his family and their rivals in Castellamare del Golfo, the Bucciolato family. Magadino, he really never knew any other life other than crime. From his childhood until the day he died, he was going to go into crime. He was going to form a crime family. He's just one of those kids that was literally born into the mafia. There was no other path. There was no other option. That was what he was going to do. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, that was it. You're in the mafia from the day you're born. And honestly, there's no way to talk about Magadino without also mentioning Joseph Bonanno. Magadino had strong links with the Bonanno family back in Sicily. Stefano was Joseph Bonanno's uncle. He was his mother's brother. He was also a very close cousin, so they grew up like brother and sister. Like, I was the same way. When I was growing up, all my cousins were like my brothers and sisters. I lived with all of them at one point or another. So that's just kind of a Italian thing, is that you grow up with your cousins and your nephews and your, you know, whatever. It's, it's just a very strong family connection. The Bonanno clan joined the Magadino clan because in Italy, the clan was called the Magadino clan because the boss of that clan was, you guessed it, a Magadino. And they went to war with the Bucciolato clan, another really prominent mafia family in Castellamare del Golfo. They had been feuding with Felice Bucciolato, the leader of the clan, for like a really long time. Like this goes back forever. During the feud, there was a lot of Magadinos lost. There was a lot of Bananos lost. And there was a lot of Bucciolatos lost. Magadino left Sicily after he just, things were getting too heated over there. Things got really bad. And he just decided that he was going to head for the United States. Stefano Magadino arrived to the U.S. aboard the SS San Giorgio on February 7th, 1909, when he was 17 years old. So he's 17 and he leaves Italy to come to America on his own. Like, that's ballsy. I would never. Bro, when I was 23 years old, I had to go to Florida by myself for work for a week. I literally cried. Like, I literally was on the phone with my mom like, I don't like this. I want to go 
hub hub. I say I lived with my mom until I was probably 25, 26. Like I never wanted to leave. She cried when I left. I cried. I used to come home and sleep at in my old room while I had an apartment in Manhattan. I was just like, no, I want to wake up near you. It was bad. It was really bad. So I couldn't imagine being 17 years old and being like, peace out. I'm going to another country. But he did it. He settled in a Castella Marisi colony in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. Magadino married Carmela Carrado in 1913, and together they had four children. They had Peter in 1917, Josephine in 1919, Angeline in 1921, and Archangela after his sister in 1925. Magadino arrived, and he became a very powerful component of the Castella Marisi clan, or family, as they were referred to in America. A number of mafia families existed in the New York area at the time that Magadino emigrated and arrived in the U.S., but not the official five families that we know now. This is way before the Castella Marisi War, so it's way earlier than the organization of the commission. So there's no Gambino crime family, there's no Bonanno crime family, none of that. Right now, it's just the mafia. If you watched my last episode on Joseph Masseria, I go through the whole history of the mafia in America. So if you're interested, go check out my last episode. I will link it in the description. Back in Italy, being the son of the leader of the mafia, Stefano Magadino had grown up his entire life in the mafia. He watched from the sidelines when he was a kid, and he just started joining in on crimes by the time he hit his teenage years. Stefano was an advisor and a street enforcer for Giuseppe Pepe Bonanno, Joseph Bonanno's father in New York. Joseph Bonanno, he was another one that was born into the mafia. He was never going to do anything else. That was it. He was born. By the time he could walk, he was handed a weapon. Like, this boy was going into crime, period. He he helped Bonanno establish and run pretty lucrative rackets. If you watched my Joseph Bonanno episode, which is also linked below, I talked about Bonanno being in the same position in the mafia from the day that he was born. Pepe Bonanno, although not a confirmed mafia member, was very much so involved in the mafia, and his young son and nephew came along for the ride. In a ceremony in Chicago, Magadino was inducted into the Underworld Society and officially became a maid man. He was regarded as the leader of the Castella Marese Mafiosi in the United States, a group that was known at the time as the Good Killers. The Good Killers group was kind of like they just picked up the Magadino clan from Castella Mare and moved it over to America. It was made up of the Magadino clan, the Bon Ventre clan, and any allies that those guys had. And they just so happened to be in America instead of Italy at the time. Stefano was one of the leaders, but another very notable member of that clan was Gaspar Malazzo. The Good Killers are in the same predicament as their sister group in Italy is in. They're in active warfare with the same group as the clan in Sicily is. And obviously, that's because grudges that start in one country tend to end in another. Just like the Kyoto murder, which is why we're gonna see the Good Killers in America at war with the U.S.-based Bucciolato clan, who murdered a member of the Good Killers 15 years earlier. So this has been going on forever. A Good Killers member, Bon Ventre, was a baker in Brooklyn, and he was killed, dismembered, and his body was burned in his own bakery's oven. That sparked a USA-based war that would continue on for decades. So we're 15 years later, and it is still extremely, extremely dangerous dangerous between these two gangs. On August 14, 1916, Antonino Magadino was arrested for a double homicide in Castella Mare. Two of his brothers, Pietro and Giovanni, had been murdered back in July, so this is like only one month earlier, so it's not really a mystery why he would take this action. While Stefano was able to avoid a lot of this violence by leaving and coming to America, a lot of his family was still back in Castella Mare del Golfo fighting this war, and he had just lost two more brothers to it. 
Antonino was released in 1917 when it was determined that there wasn't enough evidence to charge him with the two murders. So not the murders of his two brothers. His two brothers were murdered and he turned around and committed to more murders to kind of even the playing field. Those two murders was not the end of the beef though. It wasn't like, okay, you know, you took two of mine, I took two of yours, we're even. Absolutely not. Guys in the States got word that Camillo Cayozzo was believed to have been an accomplice in Pietro murder and after the murder he took off and fled Sicily and he was coming for New York. That's perfect for Stefano Magadino who is currently sitting in New York. As soon as Magadino gets word that Kyoto is on his way, he starts planning Kyoto's murder. In 1921, Kyoto's dead body was found in a cove of the Shark River in New Jersey, and he had only been in America barely over a year. Like, I think a year and a few days. It had not been very long. In August of 1921, a barber named Bartolo Fontana turned himself in into the New York police and admitted to a murder. He admitted to killing Camillo Cayozzo in Avon, New Jersey on July 26th, 1921, only a few weeks before he walked into the police precinct. The Good Killers, the gang of mafiosi from Castella Mar del Golfo, are said to have ordered Fontana to kill Cayozzo in retaliation for Cayozzo's role in the 1916 murder of Magadino's brother Pietro in Sicily. Although he was only involved in the murder of Cayozzo, Fontana also informed the police that the Good Killers were also responsible for a string of other murders, and he confirmed that a minimum of 15 cold cases that the police had yet to be able to solve were linked to the group. As an immigrant that was living in the same neighborhood, he was just telling the police stuff that everybody else in the neighborhood knew, but everybody knew better than to say something. So because he had already decided to inform about this murder, he just came out and told them everything. He confirmed that it was Stefano Magadino, Bartolo Di Gregorio, and Vito Bonventre that came to his neighborhood and talked him into killing Cayozzo. He also gave the name of three members of the group that were living in Manhattan, Giuseppe Lombardi, Mariano Galante, and Francesco Puma, who were also involved in the plotting and planning of this murder of Cayozzo. According to Fontana, he was confronted by three members of the Good Killers, who would go on to press the muzzle of their pistols into his stomach and told him to swear to commit this crime or they would blow him to pieces. So he knows who these guys are and he knows that he has to do this or he's gonna die. He invites Kyoto to go duck hunting with him. So the two men headed to the River Inn in Neptune City in New Jersey for a weekend trip. They venture into the woods to go hunt these ducks and Fontana just randomly put the gun to Kyoto's back and blew a hole into his back and the side of his body. Kyoto never saw it coming. Lombardi was at the cabin, and as Fontana discussed the body with the inn's owner, Lombardi was informed that the deed was done, and he immediately left. He immediately walks away, gets on a plane, goes to New York, and tells the rest of the gang that Kyoto is officially dead, and the deed's done. Ultimately, Fontana Montana and the owner of the inn decided to wrap some stones around the body and throw it into the water. But the problem with that is it didn't stay down and the body was discovered two weeks later by some crabbers. Fontana agreed to help the police set up a sting operation in fear that he might be killed because honestly, that's really not that far-fetched. Mafia guys will kill people all the time, even if there's no sign whatsoever that they're gonna snitch, just to prevent them from maybe snitching in the future. This guy meant nothing to this gang. Fontana was a 28-year-old barber, had no criminal history, no involvement with the gang, no mafia dealings before this, and no protection. He immigrated to America from the same town as the Good Killers, Castella Mar del Golfo, as a child, and he had only been roped into this murder because him and Kyoto were best friends. This is one of the most common tactics that you'll see the mafia use. They have your best friend kill you. A lot of the time, your best friend is the only person that can get access to you when you're hiding out. You think you can trust your best friend, so even though the entire world is trying to kill you, you agree to see your best friend, and then boom, two to the head, gone. 
The police put together a plan to set up Magadino, so they tell Fontana to call Magadino, tell him that he thinks the cops are onto him, and he needs money to get out of town. Fontana does just that, and he tells Magadino that he thinks the cops are after him, he needs him to meet up with him, and to give him money. So Magadino heads to Grand Central Station, where Fontana had told Magadino he would be waiting for him. Magadino gives Fontana $30 and sends him on his way. Fontana was mic'd up during this, and as soon as that conversation was finished, a squad of undercover police officers swarmed in and detained Magadino. Later, Vito Bonventre and four additional gang members were detained for their participation in the Kyoto murder and planning. The New Jersey prosecutor decided not to pursue any conspiracy charges in the Gayoto murder, and the charges against Magadino were dropped, despite the New York police officer's testimony about the sting linking Magadino to the murder. There's a New York City police officer sitting there screaming from the rooftops like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you he killed him. I have proof. Why would you let him go? They all decide that they're not going to move forward. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a true testament to why I always always, always say, never call the cops. The cops are your enemy. They are not your friend. They are not going to help you. They are going to make any situation worse, not better. They're not going to protect you. They are out to get you, not serve you. Fontana, terrified for his life and having had his life threatened and traumatized by being forced to murder his best friend, now knows that this gang is out to get him. He goes to the cops, begging and pleading for help. And what do they do? They let the gang go, they let them walk free, and they detain Fontana. Fontana ends up being the only person to go down for this murder and spends the rest of his life in jail because he was the only one that was dumb enough to trust the cops. So don't be that guy. Really, like, do not be that guy. When they were released from jail, the whole gang knew, like, okay, this is the end. This was way too close a call. And there is still this one New York City police officer screaming from the rooftops that they're guilty. They weren't found not guilty. The police decided not to press charges. That means that the cops can come back and re-arrest them and press charges whenever they feel like it. And the entire crew knows that they have to kind of disperse. They have to go their own way, and they have to dissuade the cops from wanting to do that in the first place. Magadino fled to upstate New York. He would spend the rest of his life upstate. And while he was there, he pretty much built the Buffalo crime family into an empire. Gaspar Malazzo went to Detroit, and Vito Bonventre actually stayed in New York, and he would join the Shiro Gang and become one of the first casualties of the Castella Marisi War. Buffalo was the perfect place for Magadino to land. The proximity to Canada and the ease with which he was able to import alcohol over the border, especially in those early years where Prohibition agents had absolutely no idea what they were doing. All of this combined made Buffalo one of the only places that you would be able to get imported actual alcohol. In other words, a drink that would get you drunk that wasn't made in some tenement apartment illegally and tasted like garbage. Giuseppe DiCarlo, the leader of the Buffalo Mafia since moving there in 1908, died on July 9th, 1922, so he was the boss for 13 years, and he died of natural causes. That's like super rare to hear. Most of the time, if you're in the Mafia like that, you're gonna die in jail, you're gonna die from getting shot, so like this guy lived his whole life free and died of natural causes in his bed, so good for you. After Magadino moved upstate, he started a funeral business in Niagara Falls, and this gave rise to the nickname that he would take on The Undertaker. The funeral business, named the Magadino Memorial Chapel, was a huge source of legitimate revenue and one of the huge reasons that Magadino had never gotten pestered too much on tax issues because he was able to show where his revenue was coming from, the funeral parlor. Magadino was appointed as DiCarlo's successor after his death in the summer of 1922. This was made a little more difficult because of his son, Joseph DiCarlo, who wanted to take his spot. At a young age, Joseph had lost a lot. His brother and mother had passed away long before his father, so now he had lost three members of his immediate family, and almost felt like becoming the boss of the mafia was 
like a birthright. The leaders of the Buffalo Mafia disagreed, though, and they came to a decision that Joseph was too young and too immature to take the spot of boss for himself. That's obviously gonna lead to some seriously sour feelings from DiCarlo, who does still have a decent amount of followers within the family, and a lot of guys who feel like he was slighted by not being given the position. The following year, Magadino brought his brother, Antonino, from Castellamare to Buffalo. As Magadino established a base for the mafia in western New York and Niagara Falls, Antonino rose to the position of a very trusted advisor. Under DiCarlo, the Castello Marisi mafiosi Angelo Palmieri and Filippo Mazzara oversaw all operations within the city of Buffalo. Because you gotta think, this is all of western New York. Western New York is gigantic. You've got Niagara Falls, you've got Buffalo, you've got such a huge amount of space. So there's one boss, but then you've got people that are overseeing operations all over the state. A lot of people think New York and they think New York City, but that is not all there is to New York. Upstate New York is huge. In 1924, Magadino became a naturalized United States citizen. He settled in Buffalo, and while the leaders of the Buffalo family tried to give him the position of boss of the family, Magadino would make it very clear that his preference was to serve as an aide to Philip Mazzara. He's pretty much just shouting as loudly as he can that he doesn't want to be the boss. He already had a taste of leadership when he was a leader of the Good Killers gang, and honestly, he could just do without it. He doesn't need the extreme power and money, and he especially doesn't need the headache that comes with the title of being boss of the family. Honestly, it's said that he took control at this time, but I really think that he took the title just to kind of appease the older guys and get a little power behind his name. He doesn't really act like a mafia boss at this point. He kind of acts like he's an aide to Mazzara, so I think in his head, he was kind of leading with Mazzara, but the way that everybody else looked at it, he was the boss of the family. Magadino's relationship with Joseph DiCarlo, who's the son of Giuseppe DiCarlo, is civil, but it's really strained. Like, they can say hi to each other, they could be in the same room, but it's very evident that they don't like each other. Magadino becomes partners with Rocco Perry, who's based in Canada, and they start working together to smuggle alcohol. In 1924, Peter Magadino, Stefano's son, jumps on a Cuban fishing boat, and he goes over to Italy, picks up his long-lost cousin, Joseph Bonanno, stows him away in this Cuban fishing boat, and takes off for a final destination to Tampa, Florida. Peter got him into America through Tampa, and once they get to Tampa, the two hop on a train to get to New York, because, like, who wants to sail? the entire eastern seaboard, not these guys. So they hop on a train. As soon as they get to New York, they get off the train, and according to Bonanno, he's scooped up by an immigration officer. He didn't get deported or anything, but he did have to pay a thousand dollar bail. And Bonanno hasn't even exchanged currency yet. He has absolutely nothing. So a thousand dollar bail will leave him in jail for a long time awaiting trial. Thank God, Uncle Stefano steps in and saves the day. He pays the bail, he gets Bonanno out of jail, and he turns around he's like, yeah, 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 I helped you as a favor to your uncle, Giovanni Bonventre. I got a rep to protect. Don't you go around telling people that I'm a softy, that I got you out of jail because I love you. Like, no, 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 that's not what this is, okay? I got you out as a favor. And Bonanno's like, thank you. During Prohibition, Magadino's Western New York crime family was strategically placed to control the entire flow of illegal liquor into the United States from Canada, and they took advantage of this strategic placement. Former mafia bosses Giuseppe Morello and Ignazio Lupo were released from prison in 1920. Salvatore Di Aquila, who is Capu di Tutti Capi at the time, is scared that these guys getting out of jail is going to be competition for his position. So he goes and he puts a hit out on these two guys as well as a bunch of their supporters, 
Masseria being one of them. Giuseppe Masseria emerged as a rival to D'Aquila after he stayed in the Morello family and began leading it. Vincent Terranova and Silvio Taglagamba, the underbosses of the top gangs within the Morello and D'Aquilo gangs, respectively, are killed in a gang war that's being waged between the main leaders of the Morello and the D'Aquila gangs. Joe the Boss Masseria on the Morello side and Umberto Valenti on the D'Aquila side. D'Aquila puts out, but quickly rescinds, a death sentence against Valenti, and as a way to show his appreciation or as a cost to not have the hit on his head, Valenti goes to take out Masseria. Masseria narrowly avoids the assassination attempt. Valenti is murdered in August of 1922. After Valenti's death, Masseria becomes the most powerful mafioso in Manhattan and supports any anti-D'Aquila gangsters in Chicago and Cleveland. Joseph and John Leonardo, leaders of the Cleveland Mafia, are killed at Ottavio Perello's barbershop. Masseria ally Sam Todaro emerges as Cleveland's new underworld leader, and just so happens to be the one that took out the Leonardos as well. On January 1st, 1924, Joseph DiCarlo attacked and tried to kill Busy Joe Patitucci. I am not going to go through this entire thing again, but this is where the guy ratted and lied and then he poisoned himself and had Sam Todaro get the notebook. If you remember a few episodes back, I got super hung up on this and I like, got confused about this whole thing. If you want to check out that situation, I'll link the DiCarlo episode below. But for the purposes of this episode, just know that this is the point where Joseph DiCarlo was arrested and he was given a six-year prison term for witness intimidation and the attempted kidnapping of a witness with force of arms. On December 22nd, 1927, Filippo Mazzara, who was the leader of Buffalo's underworld, he was kind of co-leading with Stefano Magadino. Magadino was saying he wanted to be under him, that whole thing. So Filippo Mazzara, he was shot to death in a borrowed car. Joseph Di Benedito is Mazzara's heir apparent. So Di Benedito will probably step into whatever position Mazzara was in with the like co-leading with Magadino. Mazzara was another man from Castellamare del Golfo, so you know that he was Magadino's boy. But now that Mazzara is dead, there is none of this excuse for Magadino to say like, no, I want to be under Mazzara. Mazzara's gone. He's out on his own now. The Kalea Brothers organization, supported by Masseria allies in Cleveland, seems to be working to, like, strongly undermine the Magadino Mafia in Buffalo and in Niagara Falls. So they're doing everything they can to take apart Magadino's family. And one thing that we know is that Masseria, he will take an entire family apart just to take down somebody that he doesn't like. So he's probably behind the Calais Brothers organization. Mafia Capo di Tutti Capi, Salvatore Di Aquila, was murdered in New York City on October 10th, 1928. Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria is now recognized as the boss of bosses. And that is not great for Magadino. Masseria and Magadino, they do not see eye to eye. I'll get into it a little more later why, but they're not friends. Joseph DiCarlo was paroled in October of 1928, and he gets out, and he immediately runs back to the Buffalo Rackets, and he forms the DiCarlo gang. So there's this constant sense of tension building up between DiCarlo and Magadino. At least there's no war for the top spot, but it's very clear, and like you can feel it in the air that there's this tension between the two. When Magazzino came on and took the position of boss, he put DiCarlo in as number two to placate his followers and avoid a war over the top spot. Less than a year and a half after being given the spot of boss of Buffalo Mafia or whatever position he had, Joseph Di Benedito was killed on February 27th, 1929. So now Magadino is literally just standing there by himself. He has no one other than DiCarlo, and DiCarlo and Magadino, they do not get along. Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria, Capu di Tutti Capi at the time, decided in 1930 that all the Castellamarisi Mafia Mafia leaders in the United States were inciting a rebellion against his administration, and among those leaders was Magadino. 
And that is because they were inciting a riot. The Castello Marisi consisted of people like Salvatore Maranzano, Gaspar Malazzo, Joseph Aiello. Wherever the Castello Marisi were, there also was enemies of Joe the Boss Masseria. Magadino was summoned to appear before Masseria in New York City. When Magadino did not appear, Masseria sentenced him and other Castello Marisi mafiosi to death. As Salvatore Maranzano, a friend of Magadino, led an army against Masseria in New York, a conflict between the mafia faction broke out, and this is what we're going to come to know as the Castello Marisi War. Because Joe the Boss Masseria is Capu di Tutti Capi, Salvatore Maranzano, who was born in Castello Mare del Golfo, so you know him and Magadino are boys, he comes up and he's like, no, I don't want you to be Capu di Tutti Capi. I want to be Capu di to T copy. So he wants the position of boss. Masseria will take apart an entire family to get to the people that he doesn't like. So he was in Chicago and Joseph Aiello was leading in Chicago and Joseph Aiello was Sicilian. And Masseria stepped in and he got Al Capone put in as the leader of the Chicago Mafia. Why? Because Joseph Aiello was besties with the Casella Marisi clan and he didn't like that. So he put Capone in. He went and talked Sam Sidaro into killing Joseph and John Leonardo. He just, he did whatever he could to make sure that his people were the leaders of every family across the entire United States. So you know that Masseria is coming for Magadino. He does not want him to be boss. Why? Because he's friends with Salvatore Maranzano and he's in the Castello Marisi clan. Masseria, he goes and he encourages someone named Chester Lemaire to eliminate Detroit's conservative mafia leadership and take control in Detroit. So he's doing, in Detroit, he's doing exactly what he did in Chicago. He went, he got Al Capone and said, listen, I don't like the guy that's leading right now, Joseph Aiello. We don't like him. So I'm going to back you and you're going to, I can't go in and do it myself. You have to do it, but I will back you. I will give you everything you need. You go in, you take out Joseph Aiello and we'll make sure that you get put into the position of boss of the family. So now he's doing the same thing here. He's going to Chester Lemaire and he's telling him, hey, I don't like the boss of the Detroit Mafia. Let's go take him out and get you put in as boss of the family. Lemaire had Gaspar Malazzo murdered on May 31st, 1930. Masseria turned his attention to Brooklyn and ordered the boss of the Castello Marisi clan, Nicola Shiro, to pay $10,000 in back payment and step down as boss of his faction. And he does. Shiro's successor, Vito Bonventre, was murdered on July 15th, 1930. Remember Bonventre? He was a member of the Good Killers, and he went down with Magadino for the Kyoto murder. That means that Magadino is going to be really, really upset at the loss of Bonventre. And he's going to want to come for whoever is responsible. Masseria replaced him with Giuseppe Perino. Not too long after being given this new position, Perino was gunned down, most likely by his own men, while eating dinner in a restaurant on January 19th, 1931. On April 15th, 1931, the Castello Marisi War comes to an end after Masseria's top lieutenant, Lucky Luciano, betrayed him and worked with Maranzano to have Masseria killed at a restaurant in Coney Island. After Masseria's death, Salvatore Maranzano, who is Magadino's bestie, declares himself Capo di Tutti Capi. So Magadino's happy. This is a good thing for Magadino. He really likes Maranzano, and now Maranzano is running the whole mafia. This is great. As soon as he takes control, he puts the five families into place and names himself boss of one of the families as well as boss of all of the five families. So he's like, okay, we're going to put five families in place. I'm going to be the boss of one of them. You all, you know, I'll give four of you a position as boss. But if there's ever a decision to be made, you will come to me. I'm the most powerful boss. This family, which is a new family, but it really is just Shiro's family brought into the fold. Maranzano is the boss. Joseph Bonanno is the underboss, and Stefano Magadino is named as consigliere, even though he's based in Buffalo. The power went to Maranzano's head very fast. Everybody that had once loved him and gladly followed him turned their back on him and started to hate him, including Magadino. Violence started to spread into Ontario, Canada, where Rocco Perry's wife, 
Bessie was murdered on August 13th, which is super sad. Like, any time a child or a wife is killed in this, it's always on accident. But it's always really, really sad. So the fact that his wife was killed is going to rock the entire group. Magadino's Buffalo organization moves into Ontario. Maranzano's men counterattack in New York, killing Masseria advisor and former boss of bosses Giuseppe Morello on August 15th. Only five months after finally defeating Masseria, Maranzano is also killed after Luciano and all of the young Turks determined that he wasn't fit to be boss anymore and he was worse than Masseria ever was. Capone emerges as victorious in Chicago on October 23rd with the murder of Joseph Aiello. So Joseph Aiello is no more, Al Capone wins. This is not great for Magadino. Remember, he's Team Castella Marese all the way, and Aiello was a member of the Castella Marese, so he's pretty upset at this. Maranzano's ego during his time as Capo di Tutti Capi had chased off most, if not all, of his supporters. If you could lose the support of Stefano Magadino, a man that will back any Castella Marese citizen, you done fucked up, kid. Like, you did some wrong shit. As one of the seven members of the commission, Magadino was selected in 1932. There were spots on the commission for each boss of the five families, the Chicago boss, which was Capone, and the Buffalo Mafia boss, which was Magadino. Seven people. Those seven people would be responsible for any decisions that would be made within the Mafia. Magadino being a member of the commission was like a huge thing. Luciano literally made an exception to the rule of the commission being made up of just the five families to make sure that Al Capone and Magazzino had a say in what was going to go on. And that'll give you a sense of just how powerful and how respected Magadino is. For them to say like, okay, we want a commission and the commissions could be made up of the bosses of the five families. And then, well, you know, Buffalo needs to have a say. So they give Magadino the spot and him and El Capone are the only ones that had an exception made for them. So that's a huge amount of respect. Luciano is not from Castellamer del Golfo, but he does know the respect that Magadino has earned and he gives them the say. He gives them a spot in the commission. Magadino's family in western New York, with Joseph DiCarlo as the underboss, started to concentrate on illegal gambling because prohibition had been repealed. When the prohibition era came to an end, the only way for Magadino to keep earning is, like, gambling. A group of dissident bookmakers protested Magadino's tax on their profits in 1936. On May 19th, 1936, a bomb that was intended for Magadino exploded at the house of his sister and brother-in-law at 1651 Whitney Avenue, Niagara Falls, New York. Magadino's sister, 42-year-old Archangela Longo, was killed from burns that she obtained trying to get her girls out of the house after the explosion. Her three young daughters, Josephine, 17, Rose, 14, and Lena, 11, were injured in the explosion. None of them were seriously injured. They just got a few scrapes and burns, but the mother did not make it out. $15,000 worth of damage was done from that bomb, and it wasn't even just her house. It wasn't one of those standalone homes where she has a ton of property. This is in a neighborhood where the houses are like right on top of each other. So when the bomb went off, it did damage to multiple houses. There were people that lived three houses over that were impacted so badly from the bomb that they were thrown out of their bed while they slept. It seems like the confusion happened because Stefano Magadino lived right next door to his sister with his wife and children. Somebody threw a bomb through the window of the lower level of Longo's home, probably thinking it was Magadino's house, and that's why her house was targeted instead. She lived at 1651 Whitney Avenue. Stefano lived at 1653 Whitney Avenue, so right next door. When she died, there was an obituary put out, and it said that she was survived by her husband, her three daughters, Rose, Josephine, and Lena Longo, all of this city, three brothers, Stephen, Casper, and Anthony Magadino, of this city, two sisters, Miss Josephine Jenna and Miss Rosario Magadino, both of Brooklyn, and her mother, Miss Joseph Magadino of Italy. 
I always thought her mom's name was a little weird. Her mom's name is Giovanni. Like, she has a man's name. I don't know why. And even when they put that out, they said Joseph. I Honestly, the first time I read it, I read it as Josephine because I'm like, this is the mother. But no, her name is Joseph. So I don't know. After his sister was killed, over the next year, the rebel organization, like, the whole leadership was all killed. Like, a lot of people died from this. And good. How are you going to kill Stefano Magadino's sister? And what if it was his house? You think he's going to not go after you if it's his wife and kids? Like, not the smartest move. So all these people die. And honestly, they got what they had coming to them. It's believed that this whole tax squabble came about after Magadino gave his brother-in-law, Nicholas Longo, control of the rackets and control of like collecting all the taxes and everything that had to go on between the bookies. Longo, without Magadino's knowledge, turned around and raised the tax and he was skimming that raise off the top and giving Magadino what he originally thought that he was supposed to get and just taking the difference. When the bookies got mad, they came back after the two of them. Since Longo was so involved in this dispute, it really isn't known 100% whether the bomb was supposed to go off at Magadino's house or at Longo's house. It could have been either or because both of them were mixed up in this squabble. But either way, it definitely was not intended to kill a wife or children. Like That was just a tragic mistake. But one that whoever placed it, it was likely to happen. I don't know how they didn't think it was going to happen. There's a family sleeping in that house overnight. What do you think is going to happen? After Magazino killed everybody that was involved in the bombing, he couldn't really do anything about Longo. What are you going to do? Longo is the only parent that his three nieces have now, and he can't take that away. His nieces need somebody to raise them. He decided that the best course of action would be to banish Longo to New Jersey and told him that he had no future dealings with the mafia and he was to go straight edge, don't ever talk to somebody from the mafia again. And that's what Longo did. In the 1940s and 1950s, the local mafia extended, and they went into central New York, they went into southern Ontario, Canada, they started to branch out as much as possible. The Buffalo Local 210 of the Labor's Union came under their control as well. John Montana, who took over as Medito's underboss in Buffalo, was a prominent businessman and a political figure in the area who assisted Magadino with establishing a lot of really important connections to local authorities. If you're looking at this from an outside perspective, what you're going to see is Stefano Magadino objecting to what he views as Joseph Bonanno's incursions into Magadino's protected territory in Canada, when Bonanno sent one of his top aides, Carmine Galante, to establish the French connection. But to be honest, like, I talked a lot about the French connection in my Carmine Galante video, so if you want to go take a look at that one, you're more than welcome. But to be honest, I said it in that video, I'll say it in this one, I don't believe any of this. As much squabbles as Magadino and Bonanno have between the two of them, what other people don't really understand is that at the end of the day, it is the two of these guys against the world. None of this shit matters to them. They're family. That's all there is to it. Like, there's no breaking these two up. So as much as, you know, there's beef and you hear about arguments and blah, 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 there will never be actual bad blood between these two. New York State Police observe a gathering of criminal figures at Joseph Barbera's house in Appalachian, New York. Using a roadblock, police were able to succeed in capturing and identifying dozens of underworld leaders, and they were able to question them, put them on trial, and it got a lot of people that they didn't even know they were looking for. The FBI, which had denied the existence of any kind of national criminal conspiracy, is now forced to adjust to the revelations that came about after the Appalachian Conference. After the Appalachian Conference kind of made the mafia something that was real, something that was tangible and couldn't just be denied over and over again, it put them in the line of fire. And all of a sudden, they are now being targeted by every 
level of law enforcement. So local cops, FBI, DEA, ATF, every single law enforcement is now coming for them. Appalachian exposure was really, really bad for John Montana, Magadino's underboss, who had been a respected businessman in Buffalo and was now being viewed as a street thug after this arrest. The McClellan Committee launched an investigation into Appalachian, and this would last the next, like, two or three years. Police detained and questioned Magadino's brother, Antonino, son-in-law James LaDuca, and underboss John Montana. It's said that Magadino was there, but he avoided detection at the event by hiding in a secret room at Barbera's estate. Which is interesting because that means that everybody that was caught wasn't important enough to be given access to the secret room. The following year, Magadino was labeled a top hoodlum by Buffalo's FBI field office. Following the Appalachian Conference, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover established the Top Hoodlum Program, and that was just kind of his way of going out and saying, hey, these are the top criminals that you guys have to worry about, and it allowed the cops to arrest them a lot easier, and it just gave a lot more scrutiny to anybody that he would put in this Top Hoodlum Program. Magadino avoided questioning about the Appalachian Conference by the New York State Crime Commission in 1960 when he suddenly became ill with a heart condition, and that prevented him from testifying at the McClellan Committee trials. I don't know who this man's doctor is, but whoever he is, he's a good one. Like, he's a, he's a keeper. At this point, let's talk about the French Connection. And before we can get too much into that, we have to discuss the Papalia Agucci Network. The Agucci boys were two brothers named Antonino and Vito Agucci. Born in Trapani, Sicily, the brothers had left Italy and headed for America in 1950, but they were sent away from America as undesirable aliens. Instead of turning around and heading back to Italy, they decided that they were going to head for Canada. In 1960, they relocated to Hamilton from Toronto. So initially when they got to Canada, they went to Toronto. And then in 1960, they relocated to Hamilton. They started working closely with John Johnny Pops Papalia. Papalia had been born in Canada, so he was there forever. But his parents were immigrants from Italy. And his parents were also in the life. So he was very similar to Magadino in the terms of he was just born into this life. He was always going to be mafia. His parents led one of the three major crime families in Hamilton, the Papalia family. Together, the Papalia Agucci network became a very integral piece of the French connection. I talked about the French Connection in a few videos that I've done so far. The French Connection was a drug ring, a path to sell heroin being mass produced in France and selling it in America. It was put together mostly by the Canadian family. Joseph Bonanno sent Carmine Galante to Canada and he, together with the Catroni family, put the French Connection together and then it was operated by the Papalia Agucci network. One of the easiest ways that they found to transport the heroin from Italy to America was through departing emigrants from Italy who were heading for New York. Emigrants were rarely searched before they boarded boats to come to America, so they would just be paid to transport heroin for the connection while they were coming anyway. That went really smoothly until two smugglers were arrested and they turned informant in 1960. Their testimony led to the arrest of over 20 men, the Agucci brothers being among those 20. This drug ring arrest started like a whole chain of events, especially in regards to the two brothers, Antonino and Vito Agucci. They had been pretty important members of the Magadino crime family. Alberto was even mentioned as the leader of the gang in documents such as the Havana Conference, so think he's the way that I had talked in the past about how there was leaders in other parts of New York, like there was a leader of Buffalo, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Agucci was that, like he was the leader of huge portions of New York, and he went and represented Magadino a lot. He was at the Havana Conference, he was at the Apple meeting. He's a very, very important member of this family. So Alberto and Vito Agucci are arrested for carrying out these crimes for Magadino in Canada in relation to the French connection. They get arrested and they're like, all right, no big deal. Like, Big Daddy Magadino is going to come through. He's going to get us out of here. All we got to do is wait. 
The judge orders a huge bail for each of the two brothers, which is like asinine, and they know that they're never going to be able to post it. But again, Big Daddy Magadito, he's going to come through. He better. Weeks go by, and there is no sign that Magadino is going to step in and help. Alberto's wife goes to visit him in jail, and he's like, bro, like, you have to get me out of here. I can't do this. Do whatever you have to do. Get me out of here. So Alberto's wife is like, fuck, like, this sucks, but... This is where the saying ride or die comes from, and I'm a ride for my husband. Like, I'm gonna do what it takes. She goes off, and she sells the house, and she calls her relatives, and gets as much money as she can by borrowing money from her relatives, and eventually she came up with enough money to get Antonino out of jail. So now Antonino's out of jail, and he is pissed. He is like, oh, hell no. We get arrested running rackets for this super powerful, super rich motherfucker, and he's gonna let us rot in jail? My brother is still sitting in a cell. Screw that. So Antonino is all set up to go retaliate against Magadino. His plan is to tell him that if he doesn't go and get Vito out of jail and help him out of this super tough spot that this arrest put him and his family in, he is going to sing. He's going to tell everybody everything that he knows. He's going to tell everybody that even though Magadino wasn't arrested in connection with this burglary and drug ring, it's Magadino's ring and he profits regularly from its spoils. The burned remains of Alberto Aguchi were discovered on November 23rd, 1961, in a cornfield close to a Rochester, New York suburb. So that escalated quickly and did not go the way that Alberto had planned it to go. After experiencing some serious problems with a lot of lieutenants within his family in the Buffalo area, Stefano Magadino entrusted former DiCarlo gangster Fred Randaccio to lead all the mafia rackets in the city of Buffalo. DiCarlo's brother-in-law, Sam Pieri, comes out of jail after a long stint and he comes out with a lot of power. While he was in jail, he formed a lot of really close relationships with the leaders of the Profaci and Genovese crime families of New York City. And because of the very powerful connections he made while he was in jail, Magadino and Randaccio both look at Pieri as a threat to their authority. Following the murder of a fellow prison inmate, convicted narcotics racketeer Joseph Valachi begins cooperating with federal authorities. Valachi describes mafia initiation rights and hierarchies across the country, and he gives up the names of everybody. He tells all. Valachi gets on the stand and tells everything there is to know about the mafia. And Valachi is actually where the names from the five families that we know today comes from. Gambino hasn't ran that family in a very long time, but we know it today as the Gambino family because Gambino was the boss of the family when Valachi took that stand. So Valachi got on the stand and told everybody everything there was to know. After this happens, Magadino became very, very concerned about any kind of FBI penetration into his organization. The FBI installed electronic eavesdropping equipment into the Magadino Memorial Chapel, the funeral home that he had acquired when he first got upstate, and it also served as the primary meeting place for Magadino's whole family. And they placed that bug a year after Valachi testified. Within three years, the device collected enough data to fill 70,000 transcribed pages. It turns out, like most operations led by the FBI involving the mafia, the bugs that they placed were illegal. The FBI used information that had been obtained through these bugs and information that they got from a confidential informer as justification to search the homes and automobiles of a lot of Magadino associates. Because the bugs were illegal and the FBI was refusing to put forward who the confidential informant was, the courts ordered the FBI to give up the CI and they wouldn't. So because the bugs were illegal and because the FBI wouldn't give up the CI, none of those charges ever went anywhere. Magadino is rumored to be meddling in Bonanno crime family affairs and orchestrating the kidnapping of his cousin Joseph Bonanno. Magadino 
vehemently denies any of these rumors. Efforts to have Magadino testify in the investigation related to the disappearance of Joseph Bonanno are repeatedly frustrated by Magadino's illnesses. Again, he has the best of the best doctor, and this doctor is protecting him, and every time he's supposed to go stand trial, his doctor's like, nah, 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 he's too sick. Like, yeah, yesterday, he was at his funeral home chopping it up with the boys, everything was fine, but today, no. Today, he is too sick to move. So he doesn't really ever have to stand trial because he has this doctor that is 100% on top of him. A factional struggle begins to break out in the Bonanno organization because Bonanno was ousted as the boss of the family by the commission. This comes after he planned to kill Magadino, Carlo Gambino, Tommy Lucchese, and Frank D. Simone. We only know that this was his intention because he hired a top Perfacci hitman, Joseph Colombo, to carry out this hit. So Colombo gets these orders, and he's like, oh shit, this is an amazing opportunity. These are the most important guys in the mafia. This could be my end with them. So instead of carrying out the hits that he was hired by Bonanno to complete, he goes to each one of these guys and tells them that he has the contract for their heads. After Colombo came forward with this information, it became public knowledge. Bonanno is summoned to appear in front of the commission, and he tries to lie his way out of it. I have a whole full breakdown on the entire situation on the video that I did of Bonanno. I'll link it again. But if you're interested in this entire mess, the kidnapping, the murder plot, all of this, go check out my Bonanno video, but I'm not going to go through it here. But just a warning, that is a wild freaking ride. So all of that goes through. Magadino's never charged with anything, but you know, life keeps on moving. In 1958, there was a lot of people that were out for Bonanno, and everybody knew that Magadino and Bonanno were besties. So in 1958, an assassin threw a hand grenade through Magadino's kitchen window. Thank God it did not explode, so his family didn't die, but somebody sure tried to kill him. Magadino guided the Buffalo family through its glory years, and this is the most profitable and powerful the Mafia family ever had been and probably ever will be. He was an old school boss who preferred to remain in the shadows. He wasn't no Gotti. He wasn't no Joseph Gallo. He liked to be low-key. He didn't want to be in the newspapers. He didn't want to be signing autographs. He wanted to keep his criminal activities and any activities that he did in general as quiet as possible. Because of the remoteness of his territory, despite the vast amount of territory that he had, and because he was geographically insulated from the inter-family squabbles of the New York City-based families, he was held in high regard, and he would occasionally be called on to be an arbiter involving any territorial disputes between any of the crime families. So if there's any issues going on with anybody in the families and the people involved are like, oh, the person that's ruling, let's say there's an issue going on between a guy in the Colombo family and a guy in the Gambino family. If those guys are like, this isn't fair, the people that are ruling on this are biased against me, they would sometimes pull in outside people like Stefano Magadino. Sometimes they would pull in Raymond Patriarca. So Magadino was one of those guys that was just really respected. And if there was a squabble that had to be squashed and nobody was having luck getting it done, Magadino was a call that they were going to make. So at this time, profits start to slow down. There's a lot of tightening up going on. And in November of 1968, Magadino makes it very clear that he is very unhappy with the diminishing profits that he's seeing. He begins a series of very unpopular financial belt tightening measures, and he reduces the share that his lieutenants can keep from their own rackets, and he withholds usual year-end cash bonuses. So in other words, if a lieutenant goes and pulls off a bank robbery, usually they they have to give up, let's say, 10% to Magadino. And he turns around and says, okay, no, it's not 10% anymore. It's 15%. You can only keep 85% now because you have to give me 15 
5%. And that pisses a lot of people off. And throughout the entirety of this family, he always, always, always gives out like a Christmas bonus. And this year, on top of telling them that they can only keep 85% of their own rackets that they go out and do, he also doesn't give a cash bonus at the end of the year. And a lot of people are really pissed about it. And he's turning around, he's like, yo, I'm sorry, but I just don't have the money. I'm broke. I would give you cash bonuses if I could, but I have no money to give. The FBI and Niagara Falls police linked the Magadino crime family leadership to the use of telephone lines for pretty much for putting in large sports bets. Magadino, his son Peter, Benjamin Nicoletti, and others are arrested and their homes were raided in late November. Searches were conducted at each of the homes and businesses of all of the leadership of the family. And when they're searching Peter Magadino's home, they find a hidden room that has a half a million dollars in cash sitting there. IRS liens are placed on Magadino's property, and the revelation of this cash sitting in Magadino's son's home pisses everybody off. So this is looked at as a secret fortune, and he's sitting there and telling people they have to pay more for their rackets, they're not getting bonuses, but he's sitting on this secret money that's stashed at his son's house, and people are mad. It comes with a lot of dissent within people in the family. So when all this dissent starts and everybody gets all pissed off, Joseph DiCarlo turns around and he starts the DiCarlo gang up and it becomes a rebel faction that's trying to take the place of the Magadino crime family. Magadino's two top men in Buffalo, Federico Randaccio and Pasquale Natarelli, were sentenced to really long prison terms in December of that year, and that only furthered the problem. The rebel faction that had been put together chose Sam Pieri as its interim boss, Joseph Fino as its interim underboss, and Joseph DiCarlo as its interim consigliere in July of 1969. When the rebel group's demand for Magadino to step down as leader were rejected, they took their complaints to the National Commission in New York City. The commission did nothing to punish its long-standing member. Seemingly content to watch Magadino die, they didn't say, okay, Magadino can't be boss anymore, but they also didn't say, okay, Magadino's gonna get fined and have to take care of some of this stuff. So they just kind of were like, listen, not my monkey, not my circus. You guys do what you're gonna do. We're not getting involved. And the government just kept coming. They came over and over and over again. And their ability to get anything, to get Stefano Magadino on the stand at all, was seriously hampered by health issue after health issue. Magadino's bedroom had to be used for an arraignment in a bookmaking case. Magadino, who was getting older, was determined too weak by doctors to testify in court, and that happened pretty often. Stefano Magadino passed away on July 19, 1974, as a result of a heart attack. He was laid to rest in Niagara Falls' St. Joseph Cemetery. The internal war over leadership and who would take leadership of the family, it didn't stop just because Magadino died. It continued on, but it ended in the early 80s when Joseph Todaro Sr. became boss of the family. Magadino, who made it to 82 years old without ever serving a long-term prison sentence, had a pretty typical mafia funeral. Floral wreaths were delivered to the funeral home that entire day. After his death, leadership was said to have been handed off to Russell Buffalino. And that is all I have for Mr. Stefano Magadino. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous gangsters in history. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, comment, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!